kind of uh, discussion of uh, track, particular room, pretty much stays on track with uh, specialty crops, and uh, we're going to continue on the hazelnut strain of things this afternoon with uh, Amanda Sames from the University of Minnesota talking about some of the market development. Uh, so let's welcome Amanda. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so why are we talking about market development? You have no idea how long it took me to take this picture, by the way. I coaxed her in with hazelnut shells, if you can see on the bottom. Because <laughs> it's a little bit of a chicken and egg situation. Do we, you know, we've had some people here talking about developing the hazelnut crop, but we also have to develop a market so that we have something to do with the crop. Uh, so we're trying to figure out a way to kind of work on both at the same time. If you were in this room earlier, you heard a couple great presentations about how we're working on developing some of the uh, genetics, working on propagation, other aspects like that. So I'm picking up the market development piece here. And we did that through a series of a few interviews uh, and then one little focus group. But we wanted to talk to chefs, particularly kind of high-end and mid-range restaurants that might be interested in using local foods because these hazelnuts are a really great and exciting uh, local food item. People have been hearing about them for the last year or two. It seems like there's a lot of excitement, uh, especially at the Moses conference. Talked to a lot of chefs who said, oh, this was all the rage at Moses. Tell me all, all you know about hazelnuts. Uh, so we thought that there could be some great potential there in developing that market. Um, and then we had a thought halfway through uh, this project that maybe someone knows what to do with the shells. Uh, so we pulled together a quick little focus group, and I'll try to talk about that if I have time. I apologize if I talk fast. I'm going to try to get through a lot. Uh, so I did a total of seven interviews. It wasn't a ton, um, but we talked to six chefs. There were two restaurateurs, a little bit of overlap there. Uh, most were dine-in restaurants, but I did get a chance to talk to two caterers, uh, very different kind of styles of cooking in a dine-in restaurant versus a catering service. And we talked to people about whether they'd be interested in hazelnuts. We brought samples for everyone to taste. Did they like it? What would they pay? That was an important question for us. Uh, people love them. They really, really want access to locally grown hazelnuts. Uh, there's a very high level of interest. Most people are using hazelnuts. Um, no, I take that back. Everyone's using hazelnuts. Everyone's importing hazelnuts. Uh, only one person is using hazelnut oil. Also, it's being imported from out west. Um, the big thing was that no one knew where to get local nuts. They knew they were being grown. They knew they liked them. They knew they wanted them. No idea how to access the market. Uh, flavor. This was the thing that hooked a lot of folks. They would go to their pantry and bring out the hazelnuts that they have imported, do a taste test at the same time. And so the words that were used to describe the Minnesota uh, Minnesota hazelnuts were things like fresh and rich and nutty, hazelnutty. Uh, <laughs> also, pecani was interesting, a clean and sweet taste. Um, this is in contrast to the hazelnuts that they had in their pantry, which one person described as mildewy. Um, <laughs> right? And then the oil, again, that fresh component, people really were drawn to the fresh, clean flavor of that oil as well as the nuts. There are a couple caveats, though, to that high level of interest I mentioned. The first being convenience. Um, people really don't want to have to struggle to find them. They don't know where to get them, so they don't want to have to go out of their way to get them. Uh, that means convenient distribution, maybe tying into existing distribution networks. There are a few different distributors in the Twin Cities area of Minnesota who do a pretty good job of collecting from a lot of different local places. Uh, they serve co-ops, they serve some restaurants that focus on local or sustainable food. A lot of folks recommended tying in with distributors like that. But then there's also the consistency. People want regular access uh, to the product. So I talked to people at one restaurant who got one big uh, kind of shipment of local hazelnuts, loved it, put it on their menu, customers were asking for it, but they ran out and they couldn't get any more. And it was really disappointing. So I've got that quote up here. If we put the work into creating and advertising a dish, talking about the new product, I don't want to have to tell people that we suddenly can't make it anymore. Disappoints everyone. So there were concerns about consistency. If this is a small developing market, are you going to be able to deliver if I start to form a relationship with you? 
All right, so I asked people which products they would be most likely to use, and we brought samples of five different hazelnut products. There were, um, no, I should take that back, four different hazelnut products. I brought raw kernels, hazelnut oil, the meal, and then some roasted hazelnuts. I didn't bring any blanched and peeled nuts, but everyone asked about them. So they're up here, because you can see quite a few people rank those as their top preferred hazelnut product. Uh, it doesn't require very much prep on their part. The peel has just a hint of bitterness. A lot of people told me that they'd like to get rid of. Some people liked it, though. There were a couple chefs who liked that character, liked that flavor, the appearance. Um, no one wanted roasted nuts at all. <laughs> they like the taste, love the taste, but they're chefs. They have kitchens. They have ovens. They want to roast as they need. They can get better storage out of their hazelnuts. They also want to roast to the specific dish that they're making. Sometimes you want to use something hot out of the oven rather than have it sitting in your pantry having been roasted a couple months before. Uh, so there is no interest in that at the chef level. Um, I've heard from other people who are other producers who sell at farmers markets and the roasted nuts go really well. Um, but the ground meal, people were pretty wary, hadn't used it before, were curious how that would do. I left uh, everybody a sample to try, but nobody has gotten back to me to tell me how they liked cooking with it, if they liked cooking with it. Uh, the oil was popular, but expensive. And so that was the only thing, kind of putting a few people off of the oil, was can we afford it? I don't know. Um, but raw kernels and blanched and peeled nuts, high demand. So that gets us to what were people willing to pay. Uh, people, because they're currently buying hazelnuts, are paying somewhere around $9 and $12 a pound for blanched and peeled kernels. Everyone was getting blanched and peeled. I think that's the way they come through Bergen Nut Company, and that's who just about everyone is getting them from. Um, the price is fluctuating, and I heard from a few people that it's been going up as the drought out west has continued, um, and they're hoping if we establish a good Minnesota market, maybe we can come in and undercut the price of those nuts that they're importing if the price of nuts from out west continues to climb. So there is a pretty wide range of what people were willing to pay. Most answers fell somewhere between $14 and $16 a pound for shelled raw kernels, uh, whether they were just raw or blanched and peeled. Um, but anywhere from I believe 10, yeah, 10 to $20 a pound was kind of what people expected. Um, most people wanted it to be on the lower end, obviously. And there was only one chef that I talked to who would only consider purchasing local nuts if they were cheaper. Everyone else was willing to pay a little bit extra for the flavor and the locality. The oil surprised me a little bit, though. Only one chef was currently purchasing oil, and that price, 23.16 for 500 milliliters. It's steep. He wasn't going through a lot. Um, but since no one else was purchasing, they all felt like they were taking a random guess at a price they'd be willing to pay. Some compared it to maybe a high quality olive oil or you know, maybe a nice walnut oil, trying to figure out how they could uh, estimate some kind of price and relate it to what they use. So prices that people sort of guessed, tossed out there, anywhere between $15 and $30 a liter. Uh, may or may not be realistic. It was also pretty dependent on the freshness. So the reason some people said, I'd think about buying the oil, even if it cost you know, $20 for a liter or so, I'd think about it because it's really fresh and this flavor is amazing. And I would never be able to get something that tastes this good and this fresh for that price, even though it's really steep. So it's an important selling point. When it came to the meal, no one had used it, really, or one person had used it. But because they weren't certain they wanted to use it, uh, no one was able to really give me a great price. The one person who's using hazelnut meal buys it for about $16 a pound, um, and again, doesn't go through a ton, uses it as a crust on fish and other things like that. Um, and then no one was interested in roasted nuts, so I didn't even ask what they would pay. <laughs> it didn't seem worth my time or theirs. Sustainability was huge 
with a lot of the chefs that I talked to. And we didn't seek out specifically restaurants that are focused on sustainability, but when you're looking to talk to chefs who cook with local foods, there's a pretty big overlap uh, between those two circles. So of the seven interviewees, five of them said that either organically produced or sustainably produced hazelnuts, however they defined that, uh, was going to be really important and would definitely affect uh, their willingness to pay for the different products that they might be interested in. That's not a very surprising finding, but I think it's worth pointing out. There was also a desire that went along with this, though, for some distinct branding. So if they're getting a sustainable product, they wanted to see that it was distinct in some way. They wanted to know how it was traced through processing um, and have that kind of brought to their attention. There was also a lot of interest in the story behind these nuts. People were asking me all kinds of questions I couldn't necessarily answer about who grew what um, and under what conditions and why are they great and uh, all kinds of questions because they wanted that story because it's the story that will help the local guys compete with Bergen Nut Company and because if we could tell our customers the story of how eating Minnesota grown hazelnuts is good for soil and water and tell them about the farmer who grew the nuts, that would help justify the cost. They needed that story to make the sell to their customers. It made the difference in a lot of people's minds um, between maybe being able to spring for a little bit of oil, if you can tell a really cool story behind it and why it's on the plate, um, versus saying, you know, I can't afford it. So story and how we talk about hazelnuts and these you know, other crops as part of agroforestry systems, that's really important. Um, and then the branding ties into that too. I had one person very directly tell me, I'm not going to be very interested in generic branding. That sounds like it could be from anywhere or is a big industrialized product. They wanted a specialty crop if they were going to be paying for a specialty crop and they wanted it to look like a specialty crop. So quantities. We talked about how much people might be interested in buying. Most are using about five to 10 pounds a week. Uh, it fluctuates depending on seasons and what the menu has. Um, few people talked about going maybe as high as 20 pounds a week. But this is important because if we're talking about ramping up a nascent industry, uh, we need to know what kind of quantities people might be expecting. So if we're gonna start entering a market with high-end chefs, are we gonna have enough hazelnuts to provide on a relatively consistent basis, because consistency was important, at least five to 10 pounds a week per restaurant? Uh, we need to know that before we form that relationship or make any promises up front. There's a lot less confidence among the caterers, partly because they're so at the whim of customers. They said they can have a dish with hazelnuts on the menu for months and have no one order it. Uh, it's a different situation in dine-in restaurants where chefs have a little bit more control uh, over what goes out. So a less predictable market if you're talking about working with caterers. The oil. This was very heavily dependent on the price because oil doesn't fill people up. It's just there to add a little bit of flavor. Um, so it's not something that's going to move in large quantities. Um, maybe a half liter per month. Some people thought maybe a liter per month. Although I just heard one of the folks that I interviewed ordered a gallon, was it a gallon and a half? A gallon and a half, which is more than they told me they would be interested in ordering. So maybe these numbers are on the low side. So that was the hazelnuts in culinary uh, uses. Then we had this, this kind of informal focus group about using hazelnut shells because it's about two thirds of the weight of the in shell nut. You only get a third of that weight goes towards the kernel. Uh, so if we can find something to do with those shells, that uh, ups the incentive for producers, right, to consider hazelnuts. So it was a small group. It was three people. Uh, one person represented a local garden center, and then there were a couple landscapers. There were lots of others who were really interested. There were a ton of interested landscapers, really excited about hazelnuts. Um, they just couldn't make it because it was spring and everyone was getting busy. They had no time to come talk about the shells, but they were really curious to know what we discussed. So we asked a little bit, all right, plopped a big bucket of shells in the middle of the table and said, what do you like? Um, and they like the color. It's apparently a very good, beautiful color if it were to be used as a mulch. Looks pretty durable, like it would hold up for quite a while. 
Uh, they like that it was a sustainable and local source of mulch, um, but it's heavy. It attracts squirrels and other wildlife. And then the quantities are limited, just like with the nuts. So again, landscaping and garden centers, these are places where you need really consistent quantities. They said if a customer comes one year and buys a bag of this for their garden, you know, a year or two years later, when they're going in and trying to fill in any sort of uh, thin spots in their mulch layer, they want to buy the exact same thing. And it needs to be there when they want to buy the exact same thing. So consistency matters, that limited quantity aspect could be problematic. So we asked about what else we could do with the shells. This turned into a bit of a brainstorming session, but there were a few ideas that came out of it. A few folks uh, suggested it might make a good mulch for a wildlife garden. If you're trying to attract animals to your yard, this is the stuff to use. <laughs> but they're going to eat whatever else is around it. Uh, People suggested maybe as a roadside mulch, because there you don't have quite the same uh, concerns about something eating more expensive plants or seedlings. Um, although it brings up for me the concern of roadkill. <laughs> they talked about it as a component in erosion control measures. So one participant was involved in a project to create erosion control kind of socks for lack of a better word, kind of fabric tubes filled with all kinds of material. These are nice and heavy. They'll help those tubes stay in place. So they thought maybe there was some potential there. Um, also, when you're talking about uh, something that's used for erosion control, there's better equipment and uh, more people involved, so the heavy weight of it might not be such a big issue. Um, because you're a little more able to move this stuff around in larger quantities talked about replacing rocks in planters or green roofs. So you'll sometimes hear people putting rocks at the base of their planter, right, so water can kind of filter out. Um, same thing with certain types of green roof construction. I thought maybe these could be a replacement, but they aren't as durable as rocks. So that's a pretty important caveat to that idea. Uh, but the one that everyone seemed most excited about was using these as brown matter for compost. They're not going to be profitable if you try and sell them as brown matter for compost because nobody really wants to pay much for that. But if any of the processors were interested in doing on-site composting, having a really great source of brown matter could help uh, lead to a much higher value end product. So compost created on-site um, would have the benefits of uh, being very local and sustainable, being able to tout that it's made from hazelnuts, which are, again, all the rage right now, according to everyone we talk to. Um, and you can charge a lot more for a bag of compost than a load of brown matter for someone else to make compost. Five minutes? Good. Well, <laughs> I don't need them. Hopefully there's a few questions. Uh, so this work was just done over the course of a semester with a grant from the Mary J. Page uh, Community University Partnership Fund at the University of Minnesota that brought together the Minnesota <laughs> Hazelnut Foundation and then our use uh, regional sustainable development partnerships administered through the Center for Urban and Regional Affairs. So with that, I can take any questions. Thank you, Amanda. Yeah. Uh, any thought of just using the, the shells as biomass for thermal energy, heating, heating? Yeah, that did come up. No one in the focus group knew much about it. Uh, oh, sure. The shells as, as no, but no. She's to <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so what about using the shells as biomass for thermal energy? Uh, and it did come up. It was something that everyone thought, hey, maybe, but no one knew enough. No one had any experience working with it. Um, so it didn't go very far in the focus group, but it was an idea that came up. Yeah. Uh, if you looked into non-abrasive cleaners, um, that's one of the standard nutshell things, like through jet engines as well as in cosmetics and stuff like that. Sure. It's not a silica base. Yeah, using them for non-abrasive cleaners, that could be a great idea. It's a big market for walnut shells, but mm -hmm. not using the shells. Did you get any feedback? It, it seemed like people wanted the raw hazelnuts, but they didn't buy it. Is that just it's not available, or do they say why they want it, even though they sound like they don't use it? Yeah, so why do people want raw hazelnuts, but they're not buying well, raw chefs, hazelnuts? Right. The, chefs. the chefs, yep, yeah. yep. Um, 
It's probably annoying for the microphone. Yeah, they basically come blanched and peeled from Bergen. And I don't know that many people uh, had the option of getting raw, non-peeled hazelnuts. That was just how they came. In fact, a lot of people would have to go to their pantry and check if they were blanched and peeled or not, because they said, I don't know, I just order the raw nuts. Um, but they were actually a blanched and peeled nut. So there were, some people preferred blanched and peeled, some people didn't. Um, but if that's the way they're coming from your distributor, that's what you're going to get. I think it increases the storage life, a few people told me. So, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Are you aware of any health benefits of having a hazelnut? Health benefits of hazelnut? That could be a good selling point. Yeah, it could. And there were actually a few chefs who brought that up. They were aware um, of health benefits. They talked about omega-3s and oleic acids. And I'm not the right person to answer a question about the health benefits of hazelnuts. There might be a few people in this room who could. Um, but a few, a few chefs were aware that they are a pretty healthy nut and that the oil is a particularly healthy oil. Um, and it was something they were interested in, but no one seemed to pick up on that as a primary selling point, at least as far as their customer base. Yeah. So you took samples a lot, I presume. Yeah, I took samples. And did they have any comments? I presume you took raw samples, but not blanche samples, correct? Yeah, so what I took and, for samples... And oh, those sorry. raw, non-blanche samples had some pellicle on them? Yes. Yeah. And so what did the chefs have to comment about that? I mean, was that... Yeah. Because the reason I'm asking is because my observation is that our hybrid hazelnuts don't have as much pellicle as the European ones. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, is the level of pellicle that we have acceptable, or do we need to go a step further? Right. So what did chefs think about those raw nuts that haven't been peeled, and is it kind of an acceptable right. level of pellicle? Um, there was one chef who was very adamant he wanted them blanched and peeled. He said they tasted good, that the, that the pellicle on these was not as bitter and not as strong as it was on um, the eastern hazelnut, but he still wanted them blanched and peeled. Others, uh, a few others indicated they could kind of go either way, uh, that it wasn't too overpowering, that maybe if they needed them peeled, they could do it in the kitchen, but it would take a lot of time. And then there were some who really preferred them in their raw state, completely unpeeled. So it, it ranged. Because my but. understanding is that the blanching and peeling process involves light roasting and then just rolling, mm. correct? Yeah, that's my understanding, that the blanching and peeling process is, it's yeah. It, well, it's blanching, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's blanching. So it, it, it's not cooking the nut to the degree that the roasted nuts were cooked. Okay. <laughs> Any additional questions for yeah. Well, I, I just have one. I'm, I'm intrigued by the sort of, is there room for, do you think there's room for negotiation between the comments of wanting uh, consistent dis distribution, which obviously mm -hmm. is a huge challenge for an industry that's just starting, <coughs> mm -hmm. and the comment that you want a story? Because part of the story can be seasonality, mm -hmm. it can be, this week we can offer you Minnesota hazelnuts or something like that. Yeah. Did that come up at all? Yeah. So was there kind of a balance between that demand for consistent quantities and then being able to tell a good story? Yeah, yeah. It did. There was a lot of understanding. These are chefs that work with local ingredients all the time. So if you're talking about local tomatoes, you have a really short window each year where you're going to get decent local tomatoes. So they know um, that if you're trying to work with local products, that sometimes there's that seasonality to it. Um, I think the issue came up where they wanted to be able, if they were promised a certain quantity, uh, to be absolutely certain they could count on it. So if they said, over the next month, I'm going to want you know, a new shipment of 10 or 20 pounds each week, they wanted to really be able to count on that. Um, you know, For some people, that might be a little bit disappointing that you can't get local hazelnuts necessarily all year round, especially right now as we're trying to develop a market. Um, most people were understanding. Yeah. I might have missed it, but did you mention what the producers were wanting to sell the product for? I did not, because I didn't actually know uh, what the producers wanted to sell the product for. As much as we can. <laughs> 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 From 
what I've seen before, though, if you were getting those prices, they would just be almost crying with happiness. I mean, <laughs> that's way higher. Yeah, the prices that, that chefs indicated they were willing to pay were higher than I had seen in some estimates as people were trying to figure out the economics of growing hazelnuts. But Okay, with that, I think we need to wrap this <laughs> part up. So thanks for getting here.